Jewish Lecture Series. I'm Karen Matthews of University Video Communications. Our program is designed to enrich graduate and upper division curriculum with academic presentations by top computer scientists from industry. Speakers and topics were nominated by computer science faculty of more than 50 universities. This presentation is sponsored by Education and Research Programs of Sun Microsystems. Bill Joy, a leader in computer architecture, received his master's degree in computer science and electrical engineering from the University of California at Berkeley, where he was the principal designer of Berkeley Unix. A founder of Sun Microsystems in 1982, he designed Sun's network file system and worked on their scalable risk processor. Currently Vice President of Research and Development at Sun Microsystems, Bill Joy's talk today is The Future of Computing, the Open Systems Imperative. It's our pleasure to introduce Bill Joy. Bill? start with a definition of the problem that we see, but also the enormous opportunity for the future uses of computers. The, problem, the big problem in the marketplace today is that people are beginning to apply computers to very large tasks, tasks that involve many different computing systems, which must work together and which involves very large pieces of software which have to run in a distributed environment. This is a, this is a severe problem in constructing these kinds of systems, and to boot, we have the problem of very rapid change in the component technologies. Rapid innovation is occurring in many places, microprocessors are getting faster, networks are changing, and no single organization controls all the pieces. So it's very difficult to build and integrate these systems, both from a hardware and a software standpoint. What we'd like to describe today is an approach we've taken at Sun Microsystems, the one that's becoming dominant in the industry, what we call the open systems approach. This approach involves using industry standards whenever possible to allow these kinds of large systems to be built. Rather than developing our own technology, if possible, we license technology from others. And when we develop new technology, we describe the interfaces so that other people can also implement that. Um, it's in a kind of environment where we work with other vendors create a com competitive environment and one which we hope will provide better values to our customers. This kind of business approach is very highly leveraged. To give you an example of a couple of industries where this kind of approach has emerged, the first would be the PC-DOS industry, basically the set of IBM and IBM compatibles. What happened in this marketplace was IBM set some standards. Microsoft, which developed the software, licensed it freely, and a number of different companies then uh, came into existence, which provided piece parts to these people who wish to build systems. There's a lot of leverage in this industry. Some of the pieces are proprietary, but in general, the whole business environment is very open. There's room for people to add value. This allows uh, very valuable systems to be built at relatively low engineering costs. Another example is the workstation industry, where we see 32-bit microprocessors being the technology driver. It was the emergence of these microprocessors that made workstations possible that allowed us to move the power of the many computers to the desktop. The decline in the cost of RAM allowed us to put large memory on the desktop. And the emergence of Unix as a software standard allowed applications to be portable. The inexpensive Ethernet standard, the 10 megabit local area network, connected all these systems together. And so we have as another example of an industry where all the piece parts are freely available and a very high growth market where, in fact, Unix and open systems are a market requirement. So if we look at the kind of computers people have today and the kind of computers we expect to see available in people's work environments in the next five years, we see a number of older systems that are essentially one vendor proprietary standards. In particular, there's a standard based around the IBM mainframe. There's a standard based around the DEC VAX and VAX VMS, and also a proprietary standard developed by Apple Computer. The difficulty with these standards is that only a single vendor implements the base system. And so the, it's difficult or impossible to make an investment that's preserved in the different components of the system. On the other hand, we also have two open system standards, one based around Unix, uh, developed by AT&T, and one based around OS2, developed by Microsoft, which are freely available to everyone. So if you have a good idea and you wish to start a company, you can pick either to develop on OS2 
access to Aurora Enix and take advantage of all the investment that people have made in those systems. It isn't necessary to start from scratch and develop everything yourself. And that's very important because that allows innovation to reach the marketplace without reinvention of everything. So the trend in the industry and the trend for the future is that people are investing in open systems and standards. Unix and OS2 will, we believe, get the most seats, the most committed vendors, and the most applications. It's basic economics that if 100 companies can invest in something, then more money will be invested in that than something only one company controls. So uh, being in universities, you probably come in, in contact with Unix systems. The Unix system is very important uh, over the last 10 or 15 years uh, to the university computing environment. I'd like to talk next about how we see a Unix standard emerging. There's been much discussion of uh, the lack of a Unix standard or, or the many Unix standards. And this has created a lot of difficulty for the different Unix vendors. Unix today is essentially a source level operating system. There are many different versions that run on the many different platforms ranging from the PC to the Cray. There is no binary standard and that creates a big problem in the sense that you can't go down to your retail store and buy some Unix software. And because Unix didn't grow up on a single platform, there's also no single look and feel for the applications. So it's very difficult for an application developer to develop something that's, say, like the Macintosh, where his program is as easy to use as somebody else's because you can push the same buttons and the same commands. Um, part of the reason for this is Unix's long history. It was really developed in the early 70s at Bell Labs Research on 16-bit mini computers with paper terminal displays. Uh, this Unix was, was exciting. It was uh, a very powerful system. It uh, had the C programming language, which was a very advanced language at the time. But the applications which were written uh, for that system were necessarily limited by the fact that it was running on a 16-bit mini computer and the fact that there was no uh, sophisticated displays. Uh, paper terminals were exciting if they could print both upper and lower case, for example. Uh, Unix continued its evolution in the late 70s and early 80s at UC Berkeley uh, in a project I was involved with where we, we took Unix and made it run well on the VAX and developed a lot of software which worked on 24 by 80 terminals. Uh, this made Unix into a 32-bit system with virtual memory, and we added networking and screen editors. So this is a, a fairly substantial period of evolution for Unix in a distributed environment, in a 30, full 32-bit environment. For example, uh, the PC standard that we have today, um, 286 and 386, that software is still stuck in the 16-bit uh, space. Uh, more recently, say in the last five years, uh, at Sun Microsystems, we've been using very, Unix very heavily to take advantage of microprocessors and bitmap displays, which we can uh, play with by the sort of raster off primitive that you see on Macintosh and languages like Smalltalk. Uh, and the workstation market, which grew up around the 68,000 in Unix, was really the first Unix-dominated market, unless you'd call the educational computer science department uh, market a market. Unix hasn't dominated in retail. It hasn't dominated in in the mainframe uh, class machines. So it's important if Unix is to survive long term that it have one market that it owns, and this is really the market where Unix is uh, now, now totally dominant in the market requirement. Uh, what we've done in the last five years to Unix is we've put in the technical features to really take advantage of the distributed computing environment that's been emerging. Uh, distributed file systems like NFS and RFS, and the advanced windowing systems like the X11 system or news allow Unix to take advantage of graphics displays and develop sophisticated software. So what we've seen is 15 years of cultural compatibility with Unix. We've had three uh, five-year periods with three different kinds of platforms, but the application base has remained the same, and we've just added applications as we went along. There's a lot of loyal Unix users, but there's some real severe problems if Unix is to grow outside of the workstation market and outside of the universities. In particular, uh, to achieve wide acceptance of Unix, we need a single uh, Unix standard. We need, a bi in fact, a binary standard so that people can distribute software through channels other than the direct channel. You can buy software in the store on a floppy disk. Unix needs to take uh, account of DOS and OS2, which are very important. Lots of people are going to have OS2 machines on their desk. Um, Unix has a number of problems which have been uh, bandied about over the years, ease of use, security. These things need to be accounted for if Unix is to continue to exist. 
And we also need to defend Unix against what I would call the dark side, namely the proprietary vendors who wish Unix would just go away. The fact that people like to use it doesn't matter to them. They have their own axe to grind. So what we've seen internationally is an awful lot of different people interested in Unix standardization. AT&T has been working on an effort called SPID, the System 5 Interface Definition. There's an effort with an IEEE to standardize Unix called POSIX. Uh, the Europeans have an effort uh, under the XOpen auspices to standardize Unix. And Japan uh, has an effort to standardize Unix based on Sigma. Uh, these efforts are all very important because there's an awful lot of computers out there we'd like to run Unix on. The difficulty is that none of these is really broad enough in software, and I'll talk in a minute uh, what I mean, about what I mean by that. The other thing is that these people are standardizing a software base but not a hardware base, which means that even a, a Unix standard here will not allow us to have shrink wrap software. So there will still be a competitive disadvantage for Unix relative to OS2. So what we've done at Sun is we've constructed one uh, proposed solution to this problem to try to keep Unix going strong into the 90s, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about that. You can take this as an example. This is the kind of thing you have to do when you're starting with a interesting piece of software and want to take it to the market and make it survive long term. Uh, what we've done, first of all, is we've been working with AT&T and others to really consolidate the different versions of the system around a single standard. We've been merging 4.2 BSD with System 5. We're also trying to meet all the other uh, open system specifications like the SVID and POSIX. But it's very important in all this that we not only do the Unix standard stuff, but add this kind of stuff that customers and users and universities and other places really need to do with their research and development. We need a standard graphics and windowing toolkit. We need networking support. And we need the binary application standard so we can have software widely available. Those are technical things we need to do, but we need to find a business context to do them in. And the business context we've chosen is the open systems one, where we apply the, the leverage of the free market to cause the standards to emerge. What we've done is we've developed a, a risk architecture. You've probably heard a lot about risk, a very high performance, very simple machine based around the Berkeley risk system. And what we've done is we've gone to a number of different vendors and, and given them licenses to implement it so that we can provide a range of, of performances between 10 and 100 MIPS over the next few years. Uh, by this business approach of licensing, we've gotten access to the best technology. And so it's a cooperative sort of approach. And the other thing we've done is we're selling Unix in the, in the environment with the chips so that uh, just like you get software from Microsoft, from Sun, if you're a computer company, you can get a complete Unix environment. So what we've done today is we've announced that we've licensed it to Fujit Spark to Fujitsu, Cypress, and Bit, three, three chip companies which are providing us with a range of performances from the 10 MIPS range, which is available today, which is about equivalent to the top of the DAX mini computer line, up to an Echo microprocessor, which should give us about 50 MIPS of scalar integer performance, which is faster for most of the, uh, the interactive applications, say, than a Cray. Um, we're developing the binary standard, and you'll see some major endorsements of this program in the fall of 87. We, we think that this is the, the uh, way to achieve a Unix standard. Uh, other people may do the same thing, and there may be several of these, but uh, th we think this one has a real chance of uh, letting Unix survive into the next uh, uh, decade. Um, Unix to survive is going to have to coexist. Uh, we expect to link Unix to OS2 with windowing and networking, uh, to run DOS applications by emulation, to support the full range of IUMS and A protocols to link to the mainframes and DEC sort of connections to, make, to link to VAXs and so forth as well as the uh, protocols for the Macintosh to link to the Mac with Apple Talk and the, some uh, graphics links like with uh, PostScript. So if this all succeeds, what we would hope would happen is that Unix will become a, a wide and broad-based computer standard that uh, people who have innovative ideas can go out and get Unix and implement their ideas on top of Unix instead of having to implement uh, the whole system themselves. Uh, this removes the barrier to the flow of creativity to the marketplace, and it's very important. The open system philosophy is the philosophy that's causing this. Licensing of hardware and software with specs available and published allows everyone to get in and, and, and do, do creative things. And we're hoping that Spark will be the next uh, major Unix platform. So that's where we're taking Unix. Uh, what about workstations? You're all probably familiar with workstations. Hopefully you have some. Um, workstations have been around uh, now for five years. And as, as we saw before, we had these periods of five years, the five years that we saw Unix on the PDP-11, the five major years on the DAX. And we think five major years on a machine which is roughly characterized as a Big Mac with Unix, sort of a 
68,000 with, with units and a vast of a split. Um, history would suggest that things change every five years, that another transition will occur in 87, and that the preferred CPU and display technologies should change. And we would characterize this transition in 87, much like we saw in 82, the transition from mini computers to workstations, as being the transition to super workstations. Super workstations being uh, super in two ways. One, having a supercomputer-like architecture and performance to get us this, uh, up to this 100 nits on the desktop in the next five years. And super in the sense of having a high-quality graphics, uh, what we call camera-quality graphics, graphics which is so high-quality that you really can't tell the difference between a picture on your screen that was taken with a camera and a picture that was uh, constructed by the computer. So if you just uh, turn around and look at any computer screen in your environment, and then look, look away from the screen at, at, at the rest of the world, you'll see the difference between the state of the art today or whatever you have today and, and camera quality. Uh, that's a real challenge. Uh, to meet the performance challenge of putting 100 nits on the desktop, what we've done is define a scalable processor architecture, a full 32-bit machine with in, you know, normal integer instructions and floating point, but some support, especially for high-level languages and AI. Languages like Lisp and Smalltalk are very important for the next generation of software. And so we, we leveraged off the Berkeley Risk to and SOAR work to do this. Uh, we've thereby got an architecture which we've looked at the technology for and believe can be scaled up to 100 MIPS and do technologies like very high speed CMOS, ECL, and Gallium Arsenide over the next few years. Uh, we have a 32 bit data bus, 32 bit address, not very many instructions. Of course, it depends on how you count, but say 80 or 100 instructions. One thing that this architecture has is an awful lot of registers. If you look at the history of supercomputers, the machines that seem were pre-built, you've seen over time that they've had more and more registers. So we did in, in Spark is we put register windows, an awful lot of registers on the chip to support fast procedure calls and to support AI language as well. This gives us a lower off-chip data rate, and these registers you can think of as the analog of the vector registers on the credit. This is a vector of procedure parameters. Um, managed to implement this in a fairly old data rate technology running at 16 megahertz to give us 10 nits. Why is this going to scale? What we really want to do with this architecture is we want to put it in the highest performance technology available. We believe it will scale because it's very simple, that there's only 50,000 transistors. We've left off a lot of stuff so that we could re-implement it in hot stuff quickly. It leverages static RAMs. It uses off-the-shelf RAMs and flow units that generally already exist in a technology before anyone builds a processor to run. We tried to translate the Cray philosophy onto a chip. Cray machines tend to be very simple. They tend to be very clever in their implementation to get the speed, having lots of registers, large local memories, like a large cache. Uh, and this chip is, is sort of the uh, intellectual equivalent of the uh, large local store on the Cray 2 or the Cray 3. Uh, the machine is highly pipelined. Three or four stage pipelines are, are sort of required to implement it. And the kind of support we put in for high-level languages in, 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 this, in the system corresponds to the kinds of support Cray puts in for vector floating point. So what we expect to get out of this architecture is a rough doubling of the performance every year, continuing the curve you see here, which shows how Suns have uh, roughly doubled in performance every year since we started the company in 1982. Our goal is to exceed 8 MIPS in 87, 16 MIPS in 88, 32 MIPS in 89, and, and 64 MIPS in 1990 with microprocessor-based systems. We expect to be able to double the performance repeatedly because of the business leverage from open systems, giving us access to the best technology, and because the technical leverage, a very simple machine, allows us to go in and use cleverness to implement better pipelines, to continue to work on the compilers and instruction scheduling, and to take advantage over time of the extremely large number of registers and other facilities uh, that are in the architecture for performance. There are an awful lot of good ideas out there that haven't been implemented yet in microprocessors. There are ideas uh, involving long instruction orders. Instead of a 32-bit wide risk instruction, you might have a 100 or 500-bit wide lo risk long instruction. You see this in machines like a multi-flow computer. Uh, vector uh, floating point, parallel uh, organization, all these things can increase the performance. Um, there are also new technologies to apply to, to microprocessors, including as I said, an echo microprocessor, perhaps a gallium arsenide micro, ballistical, optical, whatever new technology comes along. We've tried to design Spark so that it's the simplest microprocessor around, so that the first microprocessor 
in each of these technologies has a chance of being sparked. So that, that concludes my remarks about processing why we think we'll get to 100 nits on the desktop in the next few years. Uh, let's talk now about graphics. Uh, quality graphics is very important, and our goal is to have the quality of the screen be as good as the quality of the real world when you look out there. Um, for the last five years, we've been doing uh, bitmap graphics, whacking bits on and off on the display. What we're seeing this year is a transition to, from that bit level model to what we would call an imaging model. The big transition here is that ASCII, which was the old way of describing stuff that was on the display, is being replaced by a language called PostScript, which describes printed documents very nicely in a very resolution-independent way. It describes things in real-world terms, as opposed to the sort of bit-oriented way we've been describing things in the past. The other transition that we're seeing is a transition from being, doing graphics in terms of vectors and polygons to being able to do graphics in terms of curves and surfaces. Uh, technology to do this has been described at, say, the last SIGGRAPH, and we're seeing PostScript sweep the industry uh, in the printing uh, space. Now, what, what PostScript and what high-quality, uh, say, form-shaded curves and surfaces give us are high-quality local shading. This allows us to deal with an object at a time and to sort of cut and paste them together. What it doesn't allow us to do is to really model all the properties that photons have, light bouncing around the room, bouncing off reflective surfaces, mirrors, glass, going through fog, providing diffuse lighting, all the very complicated things you need to do to do sophisticated movie animation and to really simulate the real world so the screen looks like the real world does. Uh, supporting real world quality is, is a clear goal for a computing device. Uh, we'd like to do at least as good as Lucasfilm does in their uh, wonderful movies they make every year for SIGGRAPH. Uh, the transition uh, to this kind of, be able to do this kind of thing on the workstation is going to take a few more years uh, because it involves such massive computing requirements. In fact, if we look at the, the rough computing requirements to prepare a display, looking back to 79 when we had ASCII printers, a fraction of a MIPS, say a fraction of a VAX, and no floating point operation could really put the characters up on the display. By 82, when some of us had Macintoshes or Suns or, or equivalent machines, uh, a one-bit machine could put up a bitmap raster and let us pull menus around on the screen and draw lines. Uh, to do engineering uh, graphics, you need something a little more powerful than a one-bit machine, perhaps something like an iris from Silicon Graphics, where you have roughly 10 MIPS and a few megaflops devoted to doing transforms and preparation of the real-world coordinates of the graphics information. Now, in order for us to get higher quality, what we'd like to do is to use curves instead of lines and curved surfaces rather than polygons to just, just dramatically improve the, the local shading quality of the image. The difficulty with this, of course, is that it involves about a factor of 25 to 100 uh, more uh, computing. Uh, and doing curves and foam shaded solids is something that we think will be state of the art in 88, but is probably beyond the state of the art today. To get to the kind of global shaded environment that I'm talking about, to do that in roughly real time, needs about a factor of, of 500 more computing, about perhaps a half a million MIPS to, to render a uh, Lucasfilm type movie in real time. So we're clearly have a long way to go, even doubling the performance every year. It's going to take almost an arbitrarily long time to get to 500,000 MIPS. So to do uh, global shading and real camera quality graphics, we're going to need massive parallelism. If we have a super workstation, there's some potential problems. The first being that the I.O. can be a real bottleneck. Uh, you can imagine that this aren't going to spin all that much faster, and yet the machine may be 10 or 100 times faster. So the real answer here is to use caching, to keep a lot more stuff in, in the memory, and in fact to put a battery in so that some of the memory can be non-volatile, it can be basically a stable RAM disk. Um, higher level languages become possible with this uh, super workstations, and that's real important because what we want to do here is to use the MIPS to make the code smaller. We don't want to make the code smaller by putting in a complicated instruction set. We want to make the code smaller by using a higher level programming language so that smaller groups of programmers can do interesting things. Um, the stress in all this, we think, will be on applications environments, uh, programming environments that are complete and interactive, like a small talk environment or a symbolic lisp environment or a algo-like environment, like the Cedar environment that was developed at Xerox Park. And we think a uh, stress on object-oriented programs to, to make code reusable is also very important. Okay, so we've seen how 
open system strategy can give us leverage in an environment where technology is changing rapidly. Hopefully you're convinced that that's a good strategy for the future and it may help you to bring some of your ideas to the market. Uh, we've also seen how Unix is evolving and how a Unix standard might emerge that would allow Unix to survive into the 90s. And we've talked a little bit about what's next in workstations. Uh, these are all relatively short-term things. What I'd like to do now is to talk about a longer uh, view of where things are going over the next, say, 15 years. Um, I'd like in particular to speculate on Unix, uh, the, where Unix is going, where user interfaces are going, where our processor architecture is going, and uh, where our hardware in general is going, the technology, uh, because these are major components of the uh, workstation. I'd like to try to speculate what a workstation will be like uh, in the year 2001. This is, of course, dangerous. Uh, history has shown that people generally underestimate what is possible. I'll try to be uh, an optimist. I'm uh, an optimist at heart, so I'll maybe overestimate, perhaps. But uh, let's, let's look at Unix as it is today. There's some real problems. Uh, one problem with Unix is that the C language is essentially wearing out. It's all written in C. C doesn't support the structuring for large programs. C doesn't uh, support uh, abstract data types very well. It doesn't support uh, parallel processing. Uh, we have to address these things in the large Unix programs, in particular the Unix kernel. We have to also address the needs of the next 15 years in having more ways of linking programs together. We want to be able to make what looks like a single program that runs on a, a, a bunch of processors working together, whether they're thought of as a multiprocessor or a distributed program. Uh, by evolving uh, Unix, we have to solve the problems of the lack of modularity of the code and uh, really make it possible to run on the kind of multiprocessors we're going to see in just a few years. So our hypothesis is that we'll see Unix rewritten in a language called C++ in the next few years, and that the language will support concurrency, uh, and that basically concurrent C++ will become the language that uh, really defines Unix, much like uh, C defined Unix in the beginning. Uh, we expect to see uh, an evolution of Unix to a system that supports very powerful programs running in user mode. The typical Unix applications program would then be concurrent. It would have dynamic linkages to uh, other programs in the network and to the kernel and, uh, and other resources. And all the facilities that we thought of as being part of Unix kernel mode would then be available to the applications. The applications environment would be basically a runtime for the concurrent C++ language. Um, one of the reasons why the Unix kernel is so large and unstructured today is that the extended language you see for C in the kernel is much more powerful than in, than in user mode. And so there are things you can do in the kernel but can't easily do in a Unix application. C++ and its concurrent extensions should, should remedy uh, this situation. The other thing we really need with C++ is we need an integrated programming environment. All, a lot of the things we see for Lisp or Smalltalk or with Alba-like languages, uh, C or Mesa, uh, we need an incremental environment and an interpretive interactive environment. We think this will be available in the next few years. Um, in the user interface area, uh, we've noted the problem that Unix has no look and feel. But beyond that, the state of the art today basically being a bitmap display, a keyboard, and a mouse really isn't uh, the interface of the future. We believe that uh, voice input is the natural complement to high quality graphics output. Your voice is your highest bandwidth output device, just as your eye is your highest bandwidth input device. So voice I.O. with graphics is really the way to go. Uh, a gesturing user interface allows you to wave your hands and for the computer to see your body motions and perhaps your mood. Uh, all sorts of things are possible and people have begun to experiment with uh, gesturing user interfaces. We think those will happen in the next 15 years. Uh, many people are working on the technology for 3D displays. It's very natural for the display to be three-dimensional, although there are you know, severe technical problems. Take, for example, the application of air traffic control. It sure would be nice if the air traffic controllers were standing over uh, a scene that looked perhaps like Star Wars, where they could see the little planes as light and things in, in free space, so they could see that they were going to crash into each other. Your mind is pretty good at telling whether things are going to collide by looking at a, a three-dimensional picture. Um, in fact, uh, an animated display is uh, something that we would expect to be a routine part of even the simplest applications program in, in 15 years, perhaps written by kids in elementary school. They'll have animation languages that they can program in. Uh, 
person describing this in their voice. Um, so what we expect to happen to Unix over the next few years is we're going to solve the first problem, the problem of a look and feel, by having Unix adopt one of the PC look and feels. Basically, Unix will either look like OS 2, or it will look like the Macintosh, or it will look like both, because those are things that the mass market uh, teaches people how to use. And the real uh, goal of the Unix community is going to be to produce a new way of look and feel, one that can be driven with a voice and a hands-free sort of way, uh, uses inferencing in a database uh, to, to really provide a next-generation user interface. And companies like uh, Sun and Next and other advanced uh, Unix vendors are beginning to work in these areas on a new media interface for Unix. The um, next problem we can look at over, over a period of time, over the next 15 years, is that the uh, risk architectural idea will probably wear out. That uh, risk may run out of gas, say, in five years. I mean, that's what history would suggest roughly in 1992 that there's an opportunity for an architectural evolution. Now, we could imagine that it was parallelism, that we're just going to put a lot of parallel risk machines. But in fact, parallelism is hard to deal with across a broad range of programs. Existing programs are written in low-level languages. They're written in C and Fortran and Pascal. And the fact that the programming is fairly sequential is very apparent. There's not uh, language mechanisms to automatically insert uh, semaphores very easily in most of these languages. So it's hard to make them run in general on a on a multiprocessor. Uh, so what we would expect to have happen is two things. First of all, for uh, getting a single uh, program counter machine, a non-parallel machine, uh, from a programmer standpoint, we would expect to see the long instruction word idea become much more dominant. We can expect that microprocessors based on risk with hundreds of bits per instruction will uh, be possible, and people will write sophisticated compilers to schedule the hardware and the programmers won't have to think about the parallelism, uh, fine grained parallelism, parallelism without thought. Um, this is uh, being done today on a graphics accelerator that Sun has called the TAC1, and also on the many supercomputers built by Multiflow. But this is really just evolutionarily. To, to really make a revolution in processing, what we're going to need to do is to use massive parallelism, uh, tens, hundreds, or thousands of processors. We think the right way to approach this is by using new languages, because applications that are written in a way that parallelism is uh, inherent are much going to be much easier to compile for these machines. So uh, in particular, Sun, which is mostly interested in powerful machines on the desktop, sees parallelism coming to the desktop in sort of three ways. The first way would be to solve the graphics problem, to do the massive computing necessary to make global shading possible interactively. Uh, the second area would be in uh, accelerating specific applications. For example, we might see a massively parallel machine which can be used to simulate a neural network. Um, such a machine could then be used to program uh, a simulation of, uh, say, part of the brain that uh, could do some interesting kind of computing that we don't know how to do with a von Neumann machine. But we think that having a massively parallel machine as a central device in the machine on the desktop is going to take a long time because that would involve rewriting all of our applications. Uh, that would probably be the last thing to happen. Now let's talk a little bit about where hardware technology is going. We've all heard a lot about room temperature superconductors. Uh, and I would expect that certainly by the year 2001, we'll see people being able to fabricate just some junction-like superconductors, which run at room temperature with submicron geometries. Today, we're a little bit in the situation like we were early in the century or the turn of the last century when Edison was trying to find a, a filament for a light bulb. He'd stick any random thing in and test it and see what happened. So the people today who are trying to make room temperature superconductors mess around, fabricate something, it works for a while, it sort of burns up, doesn't superconduct anymore, and nobody really understands why. But over the next 15 years, applying the powerful computers we have today, we should get a good understanding of the science. And it's clear from what we know about say liquid nitrogen or liquid helium temperature superconductors, that gate delays, at which are less than a picosecond, are quite possible. In fact, we can imagine gate delays down to a, a tenth or a twentieth of a picosecond. If we can build a machine which, with such a cycle time, uh, with such a gate delay, then a cycle time of such a machine might be on the order of ten picoseconds, which means a collection of one to ten of these processors could have a MIPS rating in the 100,000 to 1 million range. So 
for the people to build a small collection of micros for your desktop in 2001, that was, say, 100,000 times the max easily. That might be the entry-level system. Uh, so let's imagine what we would call a Sun 9, the uh, 2001 workstation uh, from Sun with one one micron superconducting microprocessor with a 10 picosecond cycle time. And then what kind of memory would you provide with such a machine? Well, we could put in 1,000 RAMs, and if you look at the RAM evolution curve, we might get to a gigabit RAM in that time frame. So 1,000 gigabit RAMs gives us about 128 gigabytes of memory. Um, those are both very large numbers. Uh, and if for resolution of the display, uh, we can just imagine that we max out at the resolution of your eye, which is fairly small by comparison to these other numbers. It's only about 30,000 megabits per second. So people have talked about the 3M machine, the one, mip, one megabyte, one million pixel, uh, one megabit display, the 111 machine. This is 100,000, 100,000, uh, 30,000 uh, machine. Uh, it's about, almost 100,000 times as powerful, and it's only 15 years from now. So clearly, uh, that's going to make an enormous difference. In fact, it's hard to get a handle on what a factor of 100,000 will do. We can look at some things like how many seconds are there in a day. Well, that turns out to be about a factor of 100,000. So that a computation that used to take a day on our backs would run in one second on this machine. In fact, anything we could have done in an hour on our backs, we could make an interactive movie of because we could produce 30 frames a second of the results of that computation. Since a year is about 500,000 minutes, we can see that a year of, of back time will turn into five minutes on this machine. Uh, and clearly, any calculation which would take a year on the backs today, if all you had was a backs, you probably wouldn't run it. In fact, just imagine that you have this machine at your house and you want to run a calculation overnight. How much equivalent VAX computing can you get in an overnight run, an eight-hour run? It's about a century's worth. So this is a little bit like the situation with uh, space travel. You can imagine if the speed of space travel is advancing, that the satellite ships that are sent out get passed by the ships with the warp drive. So starting a calculation on your VAX today that will compute com complete a century from now, why bother? Wait 15 years and then run it for eight hours. It's the same sort of situation. How can we build a Sun 9? Well, a Sun 9 might have a, uh, th a 10 picosecond cycle time. The speed of light says that about a centimeter of sugar cube sized computer will be about 33 picoseconds across. That's about the largest we can make the computer. In fact, uh, if you get some information about the Cray 3 and the Cray 4 that Cray is building, uh, you'll see that the very important thing that he has is uh, how big can the computer be? The speed of light limits the maximum sort of diameter of his machine. Um, so uh, this machine has to be substantially smaller. Uh, it has to be small enough that the main memory is within a sort of a cache miss delay uh, in terms of uh, the speed of light distance of the processor. Uh, now, of course, Cray is really pioneering these kinds of machines of building them with lasers. What he does is he, he has a laser which works in a sort of one square inch area, so uh, sort of laser beaming together all the components and squishing them down into a say a one foot cube. Uh, for 2001, we can imagine that we might use uh, sort of molecular level assembly, uh, either taking individual silicon wafers and stacking them up, uh, like we stack up layers in PC boards today. So we might have a thousand layers of uh, silicon to make this cube, or even thought out speculation on how we might get organic like micro assemblers, uh, things like little DNA and RNA to run around and assemble uh, this little uh, computer creature out of constituent parts. Uh, people have speculated on this. If you look at the book by K. Eric Drexler called Engines of Creation, he has some very interesting speculation about what such machines uh, could do. What can we say for sure about the Sun 9? I think the one thing we can say for sure is it will require new software. Any machine is 100,000 times faster than what we have today. Uh, we won't find the, the, the current software very interesting. And it'll be for many reasons, because we'll interact with it in a different way with graphics and with voice as opposed to with a mouse and a keyboard. Uh, but also just because the power of the machine allows us to use new paradigms. The other thing that's kind of surprising about the Sun 9 is that it would either have to be uh, increased in power by being made parallel, and we just have to put a bunch of them together, or it'll have to have a graphics accelerator option. If you take the kind of software that, uh, that Pixar uses today, to produce the animation sequences that are always the last one shown in its cigarette, the, the very nicest computer animation, it wouldn't run in real time, even on a machine that's 100,000 times as fast as a VAX. Uh, if we could imagine 64 or 100 of these machines with some parallel construction in a language that allows us to take advantage of them, uh, then uh, maybe that machine
actually will be fast enough, but it probably won't be the entry level system for uh, your, uh, your average engineer. Uh, so, just to sum up uh, the talk and give you a few conclusions about what all this might mean, uh, we think that uh, open systems are the way to go. Uh, open systems are the ones that are best adapted to an environment where the change will occur rapidly. If we really believe that systems will be 100,000 times as powerful as they are just 15 years from now, that sort of advance is going to occur uh, in many, many steps. Uh, things are going to be changing constantly, and we need the leverage of the open systems approach to go out and get access to the best technology in the marketplace. Only by partnering with other people can we get access to that technology. No single company makes all the kinds of computers you need today to, to build the best systems. No comp single company uh, is going to control all of the state-of-the-art technology that's going to be required in the next 15 years. Uh, Unix and Spark uh, are providing us with at least one solution to the problem of an open system based on Unix. Uh, with DOS and OS2 Linux and compatibility, uh, all the kinds of software that you want to run can be run on a single platform. And we think Unix is, has a good chance of surviving into the 90s, and Spark has a good chance of being a major Unix platform. Uh, super workstations, these workstations with tray-like performance and high-quality graphics, are, we believe, the next wave of Unix platform. A whole lot of applications are going to get written because those machines are so powerful and because of the, of the kind of quality graphics that you can do uh, once you can uh, simulate the real world much more closely on the display. So if you're thinking about what you might be doing in a few years, what kind of research you might be doing, uh, thinking about starting your own business, which is a very popular thing to do these days, I think that one thing you have to plan for is very rapid advance of technology. I think you'll have Unix to take advantage of. And Unix and uh, the architecture hardware, all these component things are going to advance very, very quickly. Uh, and it's people who know how to solve interesting problems that are going to retain long-term value in their skills in the marketplace. So, if you learn how to apply a good methodology to problem solving against a particular set of computing tools, and just be prepared. The, the tools are going to change. The methodology will, will still be valuable, and you'll have a lot of fun in the next 15 years as uh, we all watch uh, the exciting future of computing. Uh, thank you. I'm Judith Blemmer from University Video Communications, and our first faculty question is from Columbia University. Bill, with the network of distributed workstations, can we use the high degree of hardware redundancy to increase system availability? Uh, yes, I think we can. The uh, trend really is for computers to become much less expensive. And so just as today in buildings, uh, for example, there are many uh, small motors, fractional, what we call fractional horsepower motors. They're buried all over the building. It's almost impossible to count how many of them are off. there are. In the future, we can imagine that if you walk into a room, you won't be able to tell how many uh, computers there are in the room. And you might imagine that the studio that we're sitting in could have tens or hundreds of uh, microprocessors and workstations and other things, uh, all of which are using very sophisticated software so that the failure of any single one of them wouldn't be uh, apparent to us. I, I think that software is still in the research stage, but uh, it's going to be very important in the next uh, decade. Next, faculty question comes from Purdue University. What have, we, what have we learned from the experience of Unix? Should architectures be refined to suit it? And a question to tag on the end of that, can the government require Unix as a standard? I think we've learned a lot from Unix. Uh, not all of it is technical. Uh, we've seen a way in which uh, something which is uh, used by a lot of people over a long period of time in a very informal way can eventually come to be accepted in the industry. And I think that's a good pattern for a lot of work done in universities and research labs to reach the market successfully. Um, in terms of evolving computer architectures, I think Unix has done a good job of helping us discard a lot of architectures which had uh, basically undesirable properties. Unix doesn't make that many demands of the uh, computer architecture, but uh, computer architectures that are severely uh, uh, poorly designed or otherwise uh, unsuitable for a lot of programming languages also can't run Unix. And so that, that Unix really sorts that out. Um, in terms of the government requiring uh, Unix or DOS and, or other uh, software standards in their 
uh, with a Jeff String interface, see how long what a sculptor does in molding. A sculptor does in molding clay. You couldn't you couldn't automate that today on a computer because the graphics and the, and the processing aren't fast enough. So there are, there are, there are many uh, things we can imagine. Okay, and our final question. Among your coworkers, you have the reputation of finding simple solutions to complex problems. Can you comment on your strategies? Yeah, I think if you're too close to the details sometimes, uh, you tend to find complicated solutions to problems. I think part of it is a, is a, is a question of perspective. Uh, people need to go home from work. Uh, in Silicon Valley here, we, we tend to work very, very late. We need to go home and, and relax and think about things in, in a very clear way. State what your assumptions are. Question all your assumptions. And uh, try things that seem crazy. A lot of times a crazy idea that's obviously wrong can be fixed into one that's right. And brainstorming in small groups works very well. And so we, we in, encourage people to, uh, to, to regularly do, do these things, and uh, it, it works very well for us. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, thank you for joining us. We invite your comments and questions on this presentation. We hope that you will make nominations for future speakers and future topics. And for these purposes, we have provided feedback postcards under the label of your video cassette. Thank you again.